and welcome to the SharePoint Framework, a JavaScript special interest group bi-weekly meeting. It is February 1st, 2018. Welcome to February. It is a new month, and we've got a great call for you here today. As always, we're going to start off with a discussion of what these calls are all about. Perhaps you're new to the call or new to watching the recordings. These calls are part of the overall SharePoint Patterns and Practices program, and we started these special interest calls because we had just grown too much to be able to cover everything in our one monthly call. So we started some more frequent calls. This is one of them. This is focused on client-side development, SharePoint framework. Uh, we have another one on the PowerShell, CSOM, uh, managed code development as well. Attend as many or as few of these as you'd like. We're always happy to have folks on the calls. And we'll be covering, generally speaking, we have an agenda coming up, but generally speaking, we have an open discussion around SharePoint framework and client-side development patterns, as well as the PNP JS libraries, uh, which uh, we're building to help emphasize simple, repeatable, and tested designs for use in your SharePoint framework applications, as well as general client-side development. We've got two links down there at the bottom. The first one, aka MS SPP and P community, takes you to the Microsoft tech community, SharePoint uh, dev specific area of the tech community. That's a great place for general questions. Uh, if you have how do I kind of questions or getting started questions, that's a fantastic uh, spot to get those uh, asked and answered. The second link there, the SP dev docs, takes you to the official documentation for all of SharePoint development. So whether you're getting started with SharePoint Framework or whether you are looking for details around sort of SharePoint add-in development or classic uh, you know, WSP CSOM, uh, sorry, WSP managed full, blah, I'm just fumbling that all over the place. The original WSP development, all of the different code uh, details are there in the docs. Uh, we're always looking for feedback on those docs. We're always looking to improve those docs as well. So uh, if, you, if you find something missing or lacking, just let us know and we'll do our best um, to get those updated. Uh, we do have a very uh, small team for managing the documentation, so bear with us. It does take time uh, to get that stuff uh, updated and then published out through the, uh, the system. So what are we going to cover uh, on today's call? We've got a full call for uh, everybody here today. The, uh, we're going to do SharePoint Framework, latest updates from VESA. Uh, we've got some PMP.js client library updates, Office 365 CLI updates, updates on the PNP reusable client controls, and then uh, two community demos, uh, one from myself around some updates with the PMP.js libraries. I want to show you some of the stuff we're working on there. And then a demo from Rodrigo Silva on creating news articles. And I've shortened that a little bit, so that's going to be a really cool demo, sort of an end-to-end -end, uh, building on a lot of different uh, technologies uh, to create news articles and manage news articles and their publishing. And at the end, we'll see if we have a little bit of time for some Q&A. But as always, if you have questions, you can ask them in the IM window, and we'll do our best uh, to stay caught up there. Before we get to uh, latest on the SharePoint framework, we always like to talk about opportunities to uh, get involved in the uh, this special interest group as well as uh, the overall patterns and practices program in general. So you can always, uh, we're always looking for great demos. So those demos could be a SharePoint framework solution or something involving uh, the PMPJS libraries. And uh, you know anything around SharePoint client-side development, if you've written something cool and would like to show it off to the community, it's a great learning opportunity for all of us in the community to see the awesome things people are building. Um, but it's also a great opportunity for you to kind of demo your work um, and sort of show that off. So uh, I, I personally, my favorite uh, part of these calls is the community demos. I think it really benefits all of us. We really learn a lot. Uh, from seeing what other folks are doing out there and the techniques they're using um, and that sort of thing. Uh, you can also contribute on GitHub. So contributing on GitHub can be submitting a pull request. Uh, you could submit issues, you could submit questions. Uh, we appreciate all that feedback um, and are always looking uh, for folks who want to get involved on GitHub and help out with the coding. Um, that's uh, super valuable. We definitely appreciate the time folks invest there. Um, and I know uh, on lots of different areas, folks, you know, have requests for features. Why doesn't this or that 
library have a certain capability. Um, and it's not that it's a bad idea. It might just be restricted by time. So if it's something you would really like to see in a library, I definitely encourage you to write that code, um, submit a pull request. If you need a little bit of help getting started on that, uh, it's, it's perfectly fine to reach out and let us know. Um, but sometimes the quickest way to get the feature you want in a library is to submit a pull request. And then finally, uh, providing feedback. We're always looking for feedback on everything uh, we do within patterns and practices. So these special interest group calls, our monthly calls, uh, you know, the code we're producing, the samples we're producing, um, excuse me, all those sorts of things, uh, we really appreciate the feedback. And the feedback really drives our growth and drives our roadmap around uh, how we prioritize things. So appreciate the feedback we've gotten in the past and look forward to the feedback from folks in the future. So I'm going to hand things over to Vesa now for the SharePoint framework update. Yeah, or, or we can have a discussion around the PMP home office and monitor setup like Casey is commenting on that. <laughs> I'm window. Okay, so uh, so jumping on this one. So um, so from a SharePoint engineering side, um, I do apologize. Um, so we don't have actually massively new stuff for this call uh, because we're right now we're kind of locking down what we will do within the SharePoint framework and in the development side in general uh, for SPC and in uh, Las Vegas. I can't obviously disclose all of the ideas what we have and the stuff what we have in the roadmap uh, or in the backlog. Uh, but let me quickly update on certain things and, and show you some stuff uh, on the on the SharePoint framework side and then we'll move across and the other uh, community driven uh, uh, topics. And I'm trying to take over the presentation. I'm seeing loading. Patrick, help me. Okay, there it is. What happened? Interesting. We went back to a Slide number one. I don't know. You you took over and broke it. That's yeah. What happened. <laughs> yeah. Always happens. <laughs> so, um, so uh, really around the latest on SharePoint framework uh, from SharePoint Engineering. Uh, and just to clarify, uh, I personally I work in the Splat team, uh, and our team is responsible of all of the development uh, APIs and develop development patterns and guidance and documentation uh, for SharePoint development and OneDrive development as well in the future. There's some reorgs and everything else happening in our side. Uh, so, and we're combining some of these topics uh, in our, well, we ownership inside of the engineering will be combined, but uh, obviously the topics are slightly different. Now, let's actually get on going on these few slides on topics. Uh, a reminder, uh, Patrick mentioned this one already, AKMS SP Dev Docs. Essentially, we will, is a redirection to docs.microsoft.com slash SharePoint slash dev, which is our official new location of, uh, uh, for all of the development documentation. Now, we do know that these, some of these documents are not quite up to date, and we're working on that one. Uh, that is a, a, how would I put it, it's a big challenge for us uh, to try to figure out the right balance on creating samples, creating docs, uh, and updating this documentation, uh, considering the resources which we have. So we're looking into reducing some of the, the uh, guidance, for example, and unnecessarily not up-to-date guidance on the add-ins, uh, and maybe from a solution, solution uh, scenario, old scenario, solution-based guidance, and introduce them as a more approachable documentation in future. So we're working with a few MVPs and few internal resources uh, on updating these things. But yeah, so if somebody's wondering, yes, we, the SharePoint PMP, uh, or our virtual team is also owning the SharePoint development documentation all up, which is an interesting discussion. On this side, if you're interested on, if you find any issues, please let us know. And that comes on, comes back on the second slide, which I wanted to quickly uh, cover. So if you find any issues in the documentation or within the product, please let us know. Um, because in the past, we have been having quite a lot of challenges of people potentially finding issues, and sure, there's always issues and bugs in our service. But if they call the SharePoint online support, uh, the, the, the quite often the response in our official support has been something in the in line of, no, we don't support uh, development or customizations. And sure, we do. We do absolutely support customizations because SharePoint Online and SharePoint in general is a development platform or a hosting platform for your customizations. So we're trying to fix this gradually inside of the Microsoft, uh, and that unfortunately does take some time. Uh, the step number one is already that you can easily reach 
to actual SharePoint engineering people who are building this stuff, which is our team, the Splat team uh, in the in the Redmond side, uh, by using this issue list. So if you go AKMS SPDev issues, that will redirect you to the GitHub.com slash SharePoint slash SPDev docs slash issue list. And this one is automatically synchronized to our Visual Studio Online, uh, where we actually triage these currently twice a week. So also explaining why, why there might be some delays on that. Now, we triage these issues once a week, and then we prioritize them in our internal backlog. So there might be still issues, even though your bug or issue which are reporting, there might be uh, delays on getting that one fixed, because unfortunately, we do not have infinite resources in our consumption either. But we're, the key point is to let us know and give us the feedback, uh, or having a discussion on a, on a question, uh, which could be potentially an enhancement idea, and then we'll redirect you to the user voice uh, for uh, additional uh, discussion. But please, 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 if there's a docs issue, if there's something which is not up to date, please let us know so we can actually put it in our backlog and then we can balance out our resources based on uh, the demand which you are showing us uh, using, for example, this location. Now, uh, uh, Moving on on things from a engineering side, uh, one of the things what I wanted to, I showed this one, I've been in a SharePoint Saturdays two weeks uh, in a row. Uh, so first SharePoint Saturday uh, North uh, Germany two weeks back and then SharePoint Saturday Helsinki, um, which is which means that I haven't had a, a free weekend for a long, long, long time. Um, and I'm going to lose this weekend when I'm flying back home. No, uh, but one of the things what I've shown in this SharePoint Saturdays around the SharePoint development in general is this uh, chart around uh, the SharePoint framework usage. The reason why we started showing this now is that people still seem to be in hesitant. Well, I wouldn't say in hesitant because actually the usage is off the roof. But there seems to be still a, a open kind of a discussion on is people actually using the SharePoint framework? Is it actually being adapted? And the answer is absolutely. So SharePoint framework is uh, twice as popular already in SharePoint Online than SharePoint add-ins which actually gives you some sort of a, a let's say, uh, understanding on how much people and customers and partners are actually adapting the SharePoint framework. Uh, one of the things in here, uh, I'm not going to actually deep dive on the exact numbers, so they are intentionally hidden uh, from this agenda, but you can actually see the growth uh, since August. Uh, I'm not going to actually compare the exact numbers between other exact numbers to, uh, well, that's uh, kind of, well, this is not a, a right time to actually disclose them. Potentially in SPC, we can actually give you actual numbers. But you can actually see the growth of the SharePoint framework usage. And this is actual usage. People using SharePoint framework either extensions or web parts within SharePoint Online uh, and adding those to uh, their uh, portals or portals or in uh, team sites. Now, Quite often, actually, for the time being, uh, the most, the biggest usage for SharePoint Framework seems to, seems to be using SharePoint Framework web parts in classic purposing sites, which is absolutely 100% valid scenario. Because quite often, people want to have a cool, fluent web parts in the pop, uh, in a publishing portal style uh, experience, and then SharePoint Framework is no doubt the right uh, or the, the best technique to actually make that happen. Now, obviously, communication sites uh, is kind of at the future of the portal site, portal uh, or replacement of a classic publishing portal, but it's not quite there yet uh, for some of the scenarios. So customers are still building a lot of stuff on the on the on the classic publishing, or they might have already a classic publishing site and now they're adding and replacing those web parts or script editor web parts on the on the classic portal uh, with the SharePoint framework specific uh, implementation. So super cool though. Uh, I wanted to show this one to show you and demonstrate the actual usage. These are live stats uh, from SharePoint Online. This is from Tuesday this week. Uh, so you can actually see that even from last week, we got a pretty big uh, jump uh, on the usage. So there were certain customers who took SharePoint Framework into a use in their tenants, and that's always increasing them to active usage. Anyway, super cool to see the adoption. Well, less than a year ago, uh, well, we announced GA of SharePoint Framework with Whitbots uh, in uh, February uh, last year. and. Uh, GA for SharePoint Framework extensions uh, in Ignite, and we're already past 
uh, the add-ins uh, by far or twice as, as popular as add-ins and where the growth uh, curve is actually really really interesting so if you're kind of a in between should i learn the sharepoint framework well if you're planning to do customizations in sharepoint online you absolutely should learn sharepoint framework and one step at a time uh, it is a uh, it will take some time to learn that if you haven't actually had a look on that uh, um, maybe just to promote well ac is a, is, a, is ac has a awesome uh, as a awesome services on that side as well uh, from voitanos uh, great 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 training package uh, around the sharepoint framework there's free training uh, material from us as well there's other uh, providers there as well but ac is also one of the active community members uh, super active community members uh, in our sharepoint dev community so don't feel too bad on promoting him in this course uh, and you're welcome Esteem. now uh, moving on on things uh, and uh, moving on on things, quick update on the SharePoint uh, framework uh, roadmap. Uh, not actually that much has been changed here. I want to keep this one in this course to take at least a few minutes on this one, uh, always whenever so you'll know where we are. Uh, we've been promising, at, well, we've been releasing a lot of stuff since September, and that's since Ignite. Now, the next step will be the more Microsoft Craft support. This is unfortunately slightly delayed. We originally wanted to have this one out by end of uh, last year, so end of December. Uh, but uh, that was not uh, possible. We found out pretty late uh, small issues on that. Then we were planning to get it out uh, on end of January, and now it's already first of February. And please do remember to mute yourself. We can actually hear now some background noise. There we go. So. Um, right now, on the more craft support, uh, the guidance for this one and the, the, the secret way of calling third-party web API is planned to go out, and this is a teaser, but it's planned to go out next week. Now, we might still face some last-minute uh, changes on that, uh, but we're looking into getting this one out, uh, hopefully, early next week. So we actually get it in dev preview. Uh, we'll release some documentation and samples around this one, so we're able to start learning uh, how it actually works, uh, together with videos and explaining what does it actually mean. Now, like I said, it looks like it's going to be next week. Hopefully, it will be early next week. If we will still find last-minute uh, issues in the final testing, it might be still delayed for a few days, uh, but it, it is really, really coming soon. For hub sites and Cropify APIs, uh, there's two different uh, scenarios. They're, they're owned by two different people in, in the Redmond. Um, and for hub sites and hub APIs, we're looking into getting that one out uh, potentially during this month, uh, just making sure that documentation is up to date and start to preview during this month and then getting the feedback back in. And Groupify APIs is exactly in the same status. So the real official promise is by end of this uh, quarter. Hopefully, we'll get both of these out uh, in this month. The thing is, if we find late, uh, if we find some issues uh, slightly late on the on the testing cycle, then we potentially need to still delay on them. But we'll see how this goes. And I can't actually disclose all of the other stuff which is on the pipeline, because that's more uh, to be delayed or more to be announced in the North America SharePoint conference, which is on May 21st between May 23rd. Uh, in Las Vegas. So that's going to be our spring event where we, uh, Jeff Deeper and us from Redmond, uh, are going to then announce all of the new stuff and explain what's actually coming. So, super cool conference coming up as well. Uh, personally, uh, I don't quite like the Las Vegas, but hey, no can do. Uh, it seems to be the, the location where these things and conferences are being held. Um, been there once, and that's enough. Uh, so, but everybody has their own preference on that. Now, um, let's move on on things because I don't want to eat too much time. So, Patrick, let's jump on the community side of the story and let's do an update on the BMP JS and then also an update on Office 365 CLI, our reusable controls, and then we still have live demos coming up as well. But, Patrick, take it away. Great. Thanks, Vesa. Great update, as always, on the SharePoint framework. Um, <clears throat> so, a quick update on the PMP client side libraries. So right now, we're still maintaining two separate uh, libraries in parallel. And I want to talk about that a little bit because we've had some questions uh, around that after the launch. So why uh, have we moved? One of the questions was why have we put these in a different uh, repo instead of why are we in PNP as a, as a GitHub organization rather than SharePoint? And the reasoning behind that is we had a lot of feedback that our library name wasn't matching uh, the repo name, which wasn't matching the other things and so forth. So we tried with this new release 
Um, we got control of the PNP org in GitHub, which is the first thing after us after GitHub.com slash. That first thing there is, is known as an organization in GitHub. And we got control of that. So the idea of using that is we now match our scope, the at PNP scope, to the org that we're publishing out of. And that was to try and help simplify things. Other than that structural move to try and align things uh, with the scope to the org and so forth in GitHub, uh, nothing else has changed. The library is still part of SharePoint Patterns and Practices. It's still the same folks behind it. It's still the same uh, you know, ideas around community involvement and everything else. It's simply a structural move uh, to kind of better match what we're seeing uh, other folks out in the open source world doing and trying to kind of align with that. Uh, does this, another question was, does this replace the SPP and PJS? And the answer there is yes. Um, our goal is to, uh, over the next uh, five months or so, deprecate SPP and PJS. Um, but for that period, uh, what about feature parity? Are they going to have the same features? And the answer to that is yes. So when we get a feature request on one library or the other, we'll make those changes, uh, and then we'll actually copy them back and forth to each library so we maintain feature parity uh, for folks uh, for this kind of dual support period. So that's another question we've gotten. Um, and then another question is, are these ready for production use? And the answer is yes. Uh, we've got the first uh, real version, 101, is out of all of the at PNP scoped libraries. I encourage you to check it out. It's ready for use. Um, we're looking for, if you find issues, report them just as you did for SPPNP JS, but in the new repo, in the PNP slash PNP uh, repo, um, you know, and all the same kinds of, uh, you know, updates driven by that feedback are still going to occur. And so I did want to talk as well about SPP and PJS. Um, we're going to share the features for the next five months. Um, we had said when we launched uh, the new libraries, we'd support SPP and PJS for another six months. And that's to allow folks to have time to transition, as well as to give us time, you know, if there's critical bugs and things like that that come in, um, we want to make sure we get those fixed in SPP and PJS. And then over those six months, we hope folks will take the opportunity to transition their projects, um, you know, to the new libraries. And we get the question as well, when do I need to stop using SPP and PJS and move to the new libraries? Um, the, uh, the answer is never. Uh, we're not going to unpublish the packages out of NPM. We're not going to uh, delete the repo out of GitHub, but we're going to stop updating it. So if you've grabbed SPP and PJS, uh, say the latest version, and you're using that in your application and you publish that and everything's working fine, that's wonderful, and you have no reason to change anything. That's going to continue working. You're going to be able to continue installing it from NPM. I would just encourage you, if you're starting new projects or have an opportunity to migrate existing projects, to start to go to the new libraries where possible. And that's because, one, uh, we've tried to make things better in the new libraries uh, in a lot of ways. And two, uh, that's where after this sort of five-month period where we're going to be putting new features and new capabilities. And so if you want to take advantage of those things moving forward, you're going to want to be on the new libraries. So yes, I 100% understand this is a disruptive change. But hopefully that's minimized a lot by the fact the library isn't going away, it's not going to be unpublished, um, as well as giving folks this kind of six-month transition period. And we do have some transition guidance out there on moving to, uh, or mo sorry, moving from SPP and PJS to the at PNP scoped libraries. And that's something absolutely want to hear feedback on. If there's, if there's points we can highlight better or that we missed that would make things easier for folks moving, we want to hear that. Please let us know, and we'll do our best to get that document or, or, or add additional documentation or add perhaps additional videos and things like that to help folks move. So hopefully I've kind of addressed uh, some questions we've gotten around that um, and look forward uh, to folks starting to make that transition to the new libraries and starting to get feedback around those new libraries. 
Uh, I did want to talk about uh, some usage tracking for, and this is going to be really SPP and PJS is making up the, the bulk of these numbers. Um, but we're well into uh, a billion requests pretty steadily now. We had a little drop in December. Uh, that's seasonal, of course, with the holidays and everything. But other than that, we've maintained about a billion requests now uh, since September, uh, which is really amazing to see. And then down there in the bottom right, I have uh, requests uh, by month. And so I did a year over year from last January uh, to this January. And you can see we've had some phenomenal growth uh, of the client-side libraries. And I just wanted to say, uh, thank you to all of you who've made this possible out there in the community because you're taking this work, uh, using it in your projects, and then providing feedback and making it better for everybody. So really appreciate um, folks using it as well as the feedback we're getting. Um, so thank you. And these numbers are just from SharePoint Online, so it doesn't capture anything uh, that um, folks might be doing on-premises. So just to kind of frame those a little bit. And I wanted to point out, this is a new, this is a 3D object I've added to the slide. Um, I, I just, I think that adds a lot of value here um, in the slide. So that's a 3D uh, firework object. So a quick update here on the Office 365 CLI. Uh, so new release, I believe just happened hey, yesterday. Uh, hello, how's it going? Uh, so Office 365, ah, Office 365 CLI had a new release, I believe just happened yesterday. Uh, so new features around site scripts, site designs, SharePoint lists, custom actions, and hub sites. Um, there's a new user manual uh, was published alongside that new release. Um, you can see there's a, a link to a blog up there at the top, blog. Uh, mastercarts.nl Office 365 CLI050. Um, and then it's included in the official documentation uh, for the docs.microsoft.com uh, stuff, so you can check the articles out there. Uh, more articles are coming soon, and uh, Waldeck had asked me to thank uh, Velen, Robert, and Daniel for contributions in this latest release, so thanks, guys. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, it, it's uh, fantastic to see uh, folks jumping in and helping all these tools grow, um, so really uh Really appreciate the contributions from you three on the CLI and the contributions everyone does across the PNP, uh, you know, whole ecosystem uh, every month. And then uh, also nearly doubled the downloads in January compared to December. So we have. Uh, sorry, Vesa. No, 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 I, no nope. please continue. I'll, I'll jump after this. Uh, so. Oh, okay. Um, so we've doubled the downloads uh, from December to January, so great, again, to see the usage grow alongside the library uh, capabilities grow. So if you haven't, uh, check out the Office 365 CLI. It's a great capability if you're unable to use PowerShell, um, uh, if you're on a Mac, something like that. And uh, there's a lot of help-wanted issues tagged in there um, in that repo. If you're looking to get involved, that's a great way to get involved as well. And I'll pause because I think Vesa has something to add. Yeah, well, that was around that one. So let's be 100% super clear. Uh, SharePoint Online PowerShell, PMP PowerShell, absolutely the most uh, from feature for ready uh, capability. And now the PowerShell, uh, the existing PowerShells to watch SharePoint Online, what we're providing either from engineering side or from a PMP PowerShell side, uh, are only working within a Windows platform. Now, a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, we Microsoft announced PowerShell 6.0 or PowerShell Core, and that actually works across platforms. So we're now trying to figure out what is our long-term plan, uh, also related on SharePoint Online native PowerShell, but also the, the community driven of PowerShell. And it might be that at some point we'll combine some of these things together because we don't want to have a competing uh, efforts uh, within the community. But for time being, Office 365 CLI, absolutely great platform and tooling for configuring Office 365 tenants within a non-Microsoft platform. And sure, you can use that in, a, in sorry, in a non-Windows platform, and you can use that in the uh, in the Windows platform as well. Cool. And it's also uh, there's again, it's always neat to learn how different people do different things. So there's some different techniques uh, in that code base as well. If you're just looking. Uh, to learn different ways to sort of do things and see how people have done stuff. So there's some cool stuff uh, in the code as well, uh, if you want to dive into that, uh, certainly worthwhile. Um, and then uh, he's, uh, Waldeck is following the hashtag Office365CLI on Twitter, 
and as well there's a Gitter channel uh, for the Office 365 CLI uh, work. So you can check that out as well. Stepping now to the uh, SharePoint Framework Reusable Components. This is a set of reusable components um, to, to that work inside SharePoint Framework, uh, hence the name. But uh, we've got a new version uh, now available. So 1.2 was just released also, I think, yesterday um, or the day before. And these are reusable content and property pane controls um, to help you quickly build out uh, your applications with a very rich experience and a very uh, sort of natively branded experience. So these use a lot of this sort of UI fabric uh, features, um, so stuff like that to help uh, your applications blend into SharePoint as much as possible and look really out of the box and tight. Um, and AKA MS SPF, SPFX controls link there will take you to the controls repo. I want to say, or the documentation? One of those two places. It'll take you to the documentation. Yes, Sorry. Documentation. Had a, brain, had, a, had a brain meltdown there. That'll take you to the documentation around using these controls. And if you're, if you're doing SharePoint framework development and you uh, need to have these field controls, uh, an example, your property panes, uh, these are really fantastic. Um, they're really easy to use and really uh, drop nicely into your applications. And so updates on there, so new major release 1.2 uh, went out, like I said, yesterday or the day before. You can install those. Those are also within the at PNP scope, so at PNP slash SPFX dash React dash controls, and you can NPM install that uh, as, as standard. And then new controls, so there's a field controls created for field extensions, and then there's a new iframe dialogue control, and you can find all the details about that in the documentation. As well then, some fixes, uh, a theming issue with the web part title control in dark themes, so that got fixed in this release. And you can catch up on the webcast, uh, which is a, a nice introduction and overview to these controls at aka.ms.spfx-controls-webcast. So I encourage you to check that out uh, for more information around uh, what these controls are, uh, how to use them, and it's a really nice kind of introduction into putting them into your project and using them uh, in your application. Quickly again, Patrick, just to uh, yes. elaborate on this one because there's comments around Office UI Fabric in the in the Iron Window and all of that. So these controls, uh, so there's two sets of controls. There's the property bank controls. They absolutely use Office UI Fabric uh, to render the thing. So Office UI Fabric React is not a SharePoint of where these controls are. And that's really the, the abstraction layers between the initiatives. Now, in the future, it might be that we are even combining this stuff with Office UI Fabric React controls at some level, and or we'll figure out how do we brand this. But for time being, this is a own initiative uh, under the SharePoint Dev uh, ecosystem umbrella. Now, the Office UI Fabric, we are internally in engineering. We are trying to figure out how do we make that more uh, robust, more reliable, more easily usable. And that's going to then impact uh, across the, the SharePoint uh, ecosystem, not only on SharePoint, but also on other platforms as well. But more information on that one whenever we get our own stuff uh, clarified in the in Redmond side. Cool. Cool. Uh, so I think we are now, oh, oh, you have these, oh, look, look at oh, what they did. There was GIF animation. It was really, you, sorry. You had I, them so they were animated. Yeah. I didn't even I, know that. Yeah, Oops. sorry. That was accident. So my bad. So these are actually screenshots of all the controls, uh, or some of the controls, rather, all right. um, and how they would appear in your application. Uh, so uh, I didn't even realize they were animated. Sorry, I should have clicked through to get those to show up earlier. That was an accident. My bad. <laughs> You're just too fancy with the slides. <laughs> All right, so we got two demos today. The first one is from me, and I want to show a couple of the new features uh, we're putting into the at PMP SP library. So I'm going to share my desktop, and if somebody could just uh, let me know when that shows up. First things first, a uh, quick introduction. My name is Rodrigo Silva. I'm an independent SharePoint developer and technical architect, and I'm currently working for a company named Storm uh, in Ireland. Um, so basically, we, well, we, the solution I'm going to present today is a proof of concept. 
uh, that we developed for one of our clients because they wanted the capability to tag news articles with metadata as we previously used to do with page layouts and the content types approach. Uh, so for that, and inspired in the part, PNP Partner Pack, because I've used it extensively and I quite like it. So we've created a separate site collection called Infrastructure, where we store, where we have a document library to store the templates and messages to send messages to the queue storage. Uh, so I, I could potentially call directly the, uh, the flow uh, via the, the, the web part, but I actually like to track it, so I decided to have uh, a, a list to to have all the all the messages that are going to be queued. Uh, so basically, we have a SharePoint web part in the communication side in the home page. Uh, it then stores uh, a message in the in the in the list. Then the Microsoft flow basically queues that message. Uh, then we have an Azure function. It's going to get the templates, and finally, it's going to apply provisioning and do a little bit of a workaround because when it applies provisioning of a page, uh, the, the content type is site page. So I then go and change the content type, but you'll see that. Okay, let's see some action then. Okay, so this is a normal, this is a normal and out of the box communication uh, site. Oh, first of all, let me just. So, as, as mentioned, we have the queue messages here, uh, empty now, and I have, I have the templates, just three templates. One will be department news, global news, and team news. Uh, they have a message, and scope. Scope is because I was thinking if I was going to expand this or not to provision the sites as well, uh, but no, I just think it doesn't make much sense anymore, but whatever, it's still there. Then we have the home page, the home page and there's just a discrete button here to create news, and when I do it, I have the have the templates available. So let me just select global news. Um, okay, uh, so I'm going to create. Uh, uh, anyway, this is a proof of concept, so nothing visual. It's going to happen while I create, but I'll leave the function here running. And at the same time, I'm going to show a little bit of the functions code. So, okay. So basically, th this is quite simple. So we, we call the provision method. method uh, then we're going to get templates. Oh, it's executing. Cool. So basically, basically, we're going to... Hello? Yeah, we'll, we'll need the background, there's some background. Okay, okay, oh, okay. So basically, we're connecting to the infrastructure site, site collection, we're getting the templates, uh, XML provider, and then basically, after getting the template, we're going to apply the template, which is basically connected to the target site, pretty, pretty standard things. Uh, but then we're going to apply the provisioning template, and that's the workaround because I then get the template, get the, con the, the page, and change the content type. Uh, so I think it's executed. Good. Uh, I did pray to the gods of the presentations. Um, so let's see the pages. So here's the page, and let's see the properties. So as you can see, the content type is storm news. Oh, I didn't mention, so we've created a site column uh, connect, linked to, 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 to a term set, and basically we've created a content type that you know is from, from site page, and that's, that content type is called storm news. So as you can see, we have, fair enough, we have the, the news category here, uh, and another cool thing now is when I click on a page, Okay, so there's already two web parts. One is standard text. It's just to, to confirm that we apply the right templates. And the other one, as you can see, is news category. So speaking about reusable controls, <laughs> I have that as well. So basically what we do is we edit the properties of the web parts, and we'll go here. It's connected. So let's see business and curiosity. Done, done. And let's just go back here and refresh. And now it would be cool if there was other ones selected. <laughs> now, fair enough, it's business and curiosity, so it's, it's tagged, so we can, we can now 
basically use it on on search or develop it, develop any web parts, aggregate this. Uh, so uh, a little bit of the codes to to end. Uh, Okay, so we basically have we basically have two web parts here, right? So one is is the the one I showed first is the one that does the provisioning. Nothing really complex. Uh, so basically, that is a few event handlers, but this is the main thing. Is oh, basically when I show model, I just get the, the available templates. Should have done this in the start. Um, then when we create the news item, we basically we we create the news with all the all the the important information we then string we then pass to JSON and add the message to 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 the list and then we have the other web part which is uh, to, to, to going to show here because we just talked about it so fair enough we have we have the the reusable controls in this case the term picker um, and basically what I have is whenever whenever the properties change, so I have I have this event here. So whenever the properties change, I'll call, then call the set page metadata. Uh, I'll verify if if I'll basically I compare the selected terms against uh, the ones in the page, and if it has changed, then goes and updates. And I believe don't know if I was too fast or not, but we do have time for QA, and I think that's it for me. So, Rod, uh, let me ask a few questions around this one. So, so obviously, this is the SharePoint framework is on the on the front end, and then you had a queue on the back, uh, and you had something which was starting up uh, based on the requests, right? Uh, just to kind of step through the the process one more time. Yeah, that's 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 correct. So, basically, the first web parts. Uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can. So, basically, the first web parts. Um, is is going to is going to when I select and insert the title is going to create a message and I can show the message here. Yeah. So basically, I'll generate a GUID. That that's just for monitoring purposes. Yeah. And then the message is in in JSON formats. So basically, I have all the necessary JSON here. Yes. And then I have I have a flow attached to this library. Uh, yep. I, I can I can show. But it's pretty simple. It's just whenever an item is added, I'll then. Uh, add this message in particular but, to to the message queue. Yeah, but Rog, you need to remember that it might be super simple for you, but it's not super simple for everybody. So just a reminder. Uh, because it yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I completely agree. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I, I can show I can show the flow. Um, because I think this is this is an interesting discussion point as well. So in your case, technically, obviously, in the in an optimal world, uh, the the new page. Could have been created directly in the client side of web part. Now, the reason, and Rod, correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why you're using Flow is that you're able to bypass the processing to the Azure storage queue, and, or sorry, an external process, which is then using the PMP uh, provisioning engine. Because Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and, and why is that? Well, because we do not have client side version of the PMP provisioning engine, because that's actually super, 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 super complex engine, um, and implementing that right now in TypeScript or in, in uh, to be supported in client side is really, really, really time-consuming uh, solution. There's some initiatives and discussions around that, uh, but we'll come we'll come back on uh, what we will do in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, you 100% you correct, Visa. Um, so basically, I could have created the, the page, but then I would I would create the page instantly, and then I would have to go and add the web parts, and then yeah. so basically here. It's whenever the page is provisioned, it comes already with everything on it. Everything yeah. we need, it comes already. Yeah, basically, it's basically that. That, that was the option. Why? Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, and there was a Eric was asking around that one as that hey is there a PowerShell version of this one? So obviously what what Rod is showing here is a UI driven the, the actually uh, the creation of pages manipulating pages that's in the PMP PowerShell already. There will be an enhanced uh, support for all of this in February 2018 release, which will happen within a week uh, or so. Um, so there will be real native support for extracting modern pages and uh, together with web parts and then applying and creating modern pages uh, to pair together with web part and the content within web part and that's super cool but more on that slightly later yeah and another thing is um, we we did opt um, on having the different templates as well I forgot to mention so basically the one one of the requirements of this particular client was they wanted to have a centralized way to create news, but they wanted the news to be saved in different site collections according to its 
Yeah. So yeah. if it was Team News, you would go to, to a site collection. And yeah, so then we can control that yeah, quite easily with uh, with an Azure function. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a good point as well. Absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, so let me just, uh, if that's it, I'm going to stop presenting. Yeah, so Patrick, did you restart your machine? Uh, no, I was recording. <laughs> Fair point. I, 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 so my recording it seems to be going off fine, but I'm just saying that if you want to present something, maybe you should reboot uh, Skype. <laughs> or we can try if the screen sharing works. You're using it. One more time, then I'll reboot. Eric, all right, I'm going to drop and rejoin. Okay. Everybody, bear with me. I'll be and right back. Coming back on the ROTS demo, absolutely awesome demo. So, like I said, it's, it's a proof of concept, uh, all right? Uh, but I think it evolves the thinking on how we can create uh, standardized pages and standardized sites. Technically, you can do that already today uh, with the existing APIs and with the PMP PowerShell and PMP provisioning engine, you can actually define your pages and sites uh, in a structural way. Now, it's still the PMP PowerShell uh, is a PowerShell driven, the PMP provisioning engine is a managed code driven, driven uh, because there's hundreds of thousands of lines of code behind of that engine. And that's why it's not really as optimal of maybe having the modern page handling in a client side. But, but again, um, I think the solution design is, is really nice. Um, and there's options on, on policing that uh, to be more end user driven as well, or end user friendlier as well. Um, so once the JSON goes to Dashiku, is Azure running the PowerShell to create the page? So answer, answering an answer's case, well, it could be a PowerShell or it could be C Sharp. So it's either way. Uh, but there's a PMP provisioning engine, uh, the a remote provisioning engine for both PowerShell-based and also C Sharp-based operations. In ROD, is are you using just out of curiosity, is it a PowerShell or uh, C Sharp? Ah, muted. No, C sharp. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I answered. Yeah, yeah, yeah C sharp. No worries. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So, and and that's a matter of a preference as well. If it's C sharp, it's just you you have more control on the process potentially. But to be fair with the Azure function, uh, the PowerShell uh, Q act trigger is there as a preview implementation as well. So that should be should be working as well. Um. Ba -ba -ba. Now, the, the link what Ryan is sharing uh, is around uh, extending uh, the site designs and site scripts using the PMP provisioning. It's similar kind of thinking. Uh, it's, it is actually 90% of the scenario is exactly the same, except that in Rod's case, he is adding or initiating the request from a web part. But the back end is exactly the same. Yay, yeah, hey, Patrick, you, it works. Awesome. It works? Yeah. You see my screen? Yes, I can. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> One of these stupid hardware actually work. Unbelievable. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna. We're gonna end up using your recording. So, and then, yeah, but don't kill it now. So don't just keep on doing because if something happens on my no, side, no, we're gonna keep on going. Yeah. So a couple things. I wanted to show some new features we're adding here to the at PNP libraries, and like we talked about earlier, these will also uh, be transferred into the SP PNP JS uh, for now. Um, the first thing I wanted to show is actually over here. Um, we've added a method to get all the items in a list. Um, and this is something that was requested a lot, uh, enough that I finally broke down and added it. Um, this is something I do not encourage you to use often uh, because it's going to get all the items in a list. Uh, so if you have 30,000 items in a list, you're going to get 30,000 items back which isn't necessarily always the best pattern. So definitely not the method to use for your news roll-ups and things like that. Um, but we did want to add it because our goal is to make folks... Can you zoom up the font slightly? Just, just saying. Can I, I zoom up the I'm font getting old. slightly? It's my middle-aged eyes, which are getting hard to read that. I don't know if I can in Visual Studio Code. Where do I go for... Hmm? Zoom in. How's that? Yay. Yay. Better. Yay? All right. Uh, so the get all method. So we're going to run this real quick, and we'll see this spin up. And I'm going to get my items dot 
uh, length back out of this collection. So this is going to return a, an array uh, of any because we, we don't really know what we're going to get back from there, but you could always type it later. Um, but this will be our list uh, data. And so we're going to see this come back, and we're going to end up, I've got a big list, uh, very appropriately named. Um, but this will take a second, and once we spin up here, uh, and we'll send our request, you can see the logging happening here. Um, oh, ha. Pay no attention to what's happening here. I ran the wrong sample. So now we'll run. Apologies for that. We were getting ahead of ourselves. So now this will spin up, and we'll get all the items out of that list. And we'll see how many we got. And then we'll talk about a couple of options with using this method. Um, so we've tried to, to make it so it uh, still plays into that fluent API uh, that we've built. So you can see it takes a little bit. Um, you can see a request going to another request. We're doing this in pages. Um, and by default, our page size is 2,000. Uh, and we've got 6,846 items in that list. Um, and that took a little while to operate. Obviously, we had a few different requests. But some of the stuff you can do here, we've made it so select works. If you're going to get all the items, it makes a lot of sense to filter down the fields you're bringing back. So in this case, we can just do title. Filter will also work, but it's not going to work for large lists uh, a lot of the time. You're going to get errors back on the list uh, threshold size, etc. I'm sure we've all seen those. But filter will work. So if you have a list of, say, 3,000 items and you want to do a filter.getall, uh, the filter command will work. And then as well, you can use top. Uh, to change the page size uh, that, that is going to request the items in. Uh, so top will do that. You can also pass to the get all method itself the page size you want to use. And if you were to do both, uh, this top will take precedence. Um, it, will, it will use this number over this number. So if I make this 1,000 uh, and this 4,000 will use 4,000. Um, and the rationale behind that is simply, I had to make a decision, so I picked one. Um, but this will get us all the, all the items uh, in the list. And if we run that again, uh, I'll just show you real quick. Uh, that is going to change our request URLs. And while that's running, let me slide this over here and see if we've got any questions for me. Wait, SharePoint has a list view threshold. Yeah, I was surprised to hear that myself. Um, I hadn't, no one had ever mentioned it uh, before. Um, I heard that there might be a user voice entry on that one or something. Yeah, there might be a couple. Yeah. Um, a few blog posts about it as well out there. So you can see uh, we were able then to just do this in two requests because our page size was now 4,000. And you can see we were also passing the select of the title uh, there. So we've got in two requests, we've got our 6,000 items. And that's a little bit faster. So that gives you a little bit of control over the get all. So a new method there did want to show that. One other thing I wanted to show that we've done in the at PMP libraries. Um, so if I get my title, and we'll just do that to get a list. And I do the items, and I do a get. And then nothing new there, but by default now, all our collections, so items is a collection, fields would be a collection, content types is a collection, are going to come back as an array. So in the past, they were just any, and you would have to type it to an array, but now they're going to be uh, an array of any. So we've updated, so all those collection methods are going to come back typed uh, correctly now to be a raise as opposed to just being uh, a straight any to help out again with folks and a little bit of the typing and to make it a little bit easier uh, to use uh, those collection methods. So I wanted to mention that and that's across all of the collection classes have that change now. Um, so that was something uh, very happy to do uh, that had been requested in the past, and we didn't have a great way to do it. Uh, but thanks to some changes in TypeScript, we do have a great way to do it now. And the next piece I want to show is something that Wait, this Patrick, is actually a Patrick, work. Patrick, yep. sorry, sorry, sorry. Before you go there, there was a good question from Brian from. Uh, oh, I must have missed it. 
Uh, no, no, no worries. Uh, so will the, the filtering work if the column is indexed? Uh, so will the filtering work if the column is indexed? The answer is it should. Uh, my real answer is maybe. Yeah, uh, consulting it, I mean, that's your ex Yeah, I mean, it should work, right? I mean, yes. if, if you follow all the guidance for index columns and things, that should work. Yeah. Because um, at that point, you're dealing with a large list. But will it work 100% every time? I'm not going to promise you that. I know that's kind of a squirmy answer, but uh, that's your, it's that's your old uh, senior consultant speaking again on the background. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to promise anything, but potentially yes. <laughs> but yes, it should it should work. Uh, you know, in terms of the the index columns and things in the large lists yeah. should follow all the standard OData filtering, because um, really at the end of the day we're just passing that in as the filter parameter. Yes. So. Um, so the other thing I want to show, uh, and this is very much a work in progress, so what I'm going to show you works, but not much past this yet, uh, but uh, it will be for the next release. So one of the things we've had an outstanding issue uh, for a long time was the ability to add client-side pages, so modern pages, to a site uh, through the, the JavaScript libraries. And I do want to caveat this a little bit. If you're doing real hardcore provisioning, uh, the way to do that, in my opinion, is still the managed code, still the you know PowerShell, those established, the provisioning engine. Uh, those are really the ways to do it for, for all the things we've talked about in the past, right? Timeouts, permissions, all that sort of stuff. But I think it's a nice capability if you wanted to have a web part with a button that adds a new page or something like that. Um, so uh, got this. We're going to go ahead. I'm just going to run this while I talk through the code. Uh, and the first thing we do is uh, this is just to show I've added support to get the client side web part. So that's just a simple REST call that's going to go out and get all the available client side web parts uh, in in this particular web. Uh, I'm not doing anything with it yet, you'll note, but I'm just showing you can get that stuff back. Um, and you'll get back a nice array of all the parts. Uh, eventually, you'll be able to add those in as controls onto the pages. Uh, so you can see we're done, we've created our page, and we'll look at that here in a second. The next call here is to add a client-side page, and the only parameter I have to give it, uh, or that I'm going to give it, is the uh, file name. So this is the ASPX file name. I'm just using test with a random string after it, uh, just as, as you know, I've been doing a lot of these, and I don't want to have to keep changing the names. But so you can just add a client-side page, and that method gives you back the page object uh, that just got created. And so client side page, we'll take a look at that in just a second. Um, and then we can add a section to that page. We can add a control to that section. And like I said, this is a very controlled demo. This is all that works right now. But I'm adding a client side text control. Here's my text. And then saving the page will persist uh, our content updates back to the server. So if I grab our site here, I'm going to refresh this. So you can see we've got a page here, and if I open that... There's something wrong with you. Why, why would you use this kind of a theme? Because at some point I was testing apply theme, and it never gone back and put a different theme up here. <laughs> it also makes sure visually I know I'm in my site, so when I start deleting things, it's you know very clear. Um, but you can see, here's our test page. Here is my text. Uh, so we've got that added on the page. I can edit this um, and come in and make changes. So we've correctly created our page and correctly added our web part in here. Um, so I can discard changes, save and close. All that stuff is going to work. Um, and then I want to very quickly, I know we are just at the end here, thanks to my juggling around uh, with uh, my demo not working, but just to sort of show you the source of uh, how this is working so we've got a create method that actually makes a series of calls. So this is using uh, the chaining. And you'll see uh, we're checking to see if the page exists. We're adding it uh, as a template file. And then we're updating the item uh, with the client side page properties as needed to make that into a modern page. Um, and then we, we have classes then for sections and columns uh, and controls. I won't dive into this. This is all work in progress, so this really isn't anything uh, to really show off yet. Uh, but I am excited to add this capability in. Uh, I think it's going to be a nice, valuable addition uh, to the client-side libraries and give folks a little bit more uh, flexibility into what's going on. And we are going to jump back 
to quickly uh, while you're doing that closing and we do know that we went a few minutes uh, off the schedule now uh, whatever Rodrigo showed today uh, is uh, the reason why that worked all right and adding a web part everything else because that is the using the BMP provisioning engine now what Patrick is showing here could be adapted by Rodrigo in his solution and there would be technically no need to use then the flow and the remote service uh, whenever the support for these things would be uh, added on the on the platform right Yep, absolutely. And again, with just that caveat that it's permissions, and then if you've, yeah. you're trying to create a bunch of stuff, there might be timeouts, yeah. somebody closes their browser, yes. all that sort of yeah. things. But yeah. I think it's a nice capability if you do just want a quick, easy way uh, to add a client-side page and then <clears throat> put a couple of web parts on it. I think it'll be a nice uh, thing for folks. So uh, we saw Rodrigo's demo, which the full title of was Creating News and Edit Metadata Using SPFX Web Parts Flow, Azure Functions, and the PNP Provisioning Engine. A really awesome end-to-end -end demo, uh, and thank Rodrigo for doing that. We've been trying to get him on the calendar here uh, for a few weeks. So wonderful stuff. Uh, no time for Q&A. Apologies for that. We went uh, a little long again this week, uh, but I think it's fantastic uh, for the content we had. Our next meeting is going to be February 15th uh, for this call, and then February 8th for the General SharePoint Dev Special Interest Group. So February 15th for this call, next uh, next Thursday, February 8th, for the uh, General SharePoint Dev Special Interest Call. Uh, remember, learn, reuse, and share. We appreciate everybody's participation and everybody's feedback. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo, for your demos today. Thank you, Vesa, for the great updates. Thank you, Elio and Waldeck, uh, for the work on the Office 365 CLI and uh, the reusable controls, as well as everybody in the community that contributed to all our projects. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.